Hey, hey, welcome back to the show. I have a, a very interesting show lined up for you today. I want to let you know that this one's got an explicit tag and I'm gonna square that explicit tag because the, the title of the book is The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And I'm pretty sure we're gonna say that word a few more times uh, in the next hour or so. So I wanna welcome Mark Manson to the show. I love the title, I love what you're, I love what you're doing with this and I love how you're picking apart some of the self-help communities. So hey, welcome to the Urban Monk. Hey, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. So, what a what a great title. I love the fact that you know they, they asterisked out the U because you know this is America, um, and it's got to sit <laughs> on bookshelves. And I get that. Um, and actually, on the book, it has a little like ink splotch, so it's not even a it's not even an asterisk. It's an ink splotch. I'll put that up there so y'all can see. Uh, and uh, so what drove you to get so kind of raw with this title? Like, what are you seeing out there that you're just like, oh, hell no? Well, I like to, I, I just have a very irreverent sense of humor myself. And I like to write, I like to write things on my blog that amuse me. <laughs> and so I think one day I, I came up with that title a few years ago and uh, it was originally like a blog article and I think I just sat down like one rainy day and I was like, you know what, I'm going to write an article that uses the word fuck as many ways possible and like in as many offensive ways as possible. But at the same time, I want to like give amazing life advice. And so I just want to create this like awkward tension within the reader. Uh, and so I did that, and I thought the whole thing was ridiculous and uh, and funny, and people loved it. People went crazy for it. Uh, it got shared, you know, a billion times, and um, and so I was actually I was already working on the book by that point under a couple like different title ideas, and uh, I started talking to people, and they're like, "Dude, this should be your title. There's like, your title. this is people. People are responding to it. People love it. Like." slap it on the front of the book so yeah the universe gave you feedback there yeah there it is yeah exactly so in a world where so much of the advice has to do with us giving a fuck about everything you know worry about this worry about that you know just you know did you mind your p's and q's did you tie your shoelace right and all that um this seems like a little bit of permission to relax and so yeah. why should people not give a fuck <laughs> Yeah, I think I just think today we're inundated with so much information and so much different different pressures to to be amazing things. You know, you're supposed to be happy and wake up at five in the morning and meditate and have a fulfilling job and life and amazing relationships and like you know take ice baths and do all this <laughs> crazy stuff. And it's I think in in a lot of situations these things just create more pressure on people, more anxiety, um, what they do is they raise the bar of expectation. And, and then that, in many ways, that just kind of causes people to become more neurotic or, or maybe be harder on themselves, like beat themselves up more. So it has this, like, it backfires on them. Mm. Uh, so I wanted, I wanted to write basically like a self-help book about having less. You know, instead of like chasing more success or more happiness or having more dogs, more cars or whatever, like it's it's about having less, pursuing less, caring about less and just focusing your life on a couple, you know, just a few things that matter. What are the few things that matter? Well, it's a it's a personal that's a personal question. I, I try not to get in the business of like telling people what the value but um, you know, for me, it's it's very much like my writing, my art, um, my relationships, uh, my own integrity, um, eating good food, caffeine. <laughs> you know, the usual. <laughs> the usual, and everything else crowds crowds out that that uh, that song that you want to be playing there, right? Like you have the things that matter to you. So then how do you start to stop give, giving a fuck, right? Like, so what, like once you've identified what's important to you, then what do you start doing in your life to start curating it in a way where the other stuff just doesn't come in? Well, I think a lot of it is just developing the ability to, to let go. And um, 
for a lot of people that starts with their emotions um a lot of people just immediately you know if they feel something if they feel something good they just immediately assume this must be good and they chase after it and if they feel something bad they immediately assume that this must be bad and they try to push it away as much as they can and i think the starting point is just to realize that realize that uh emotions are they're just emotions they come and go they don't necessarily always mean uh that something is good or bad and that you know you need to even in those emotional moments stick with your values stick with like know what you care about and stick with them um you know even if you're having a crappy day or even you know whatever whatever comes mm. so there's some things that we should obviously give shit about right like there's right. there's our health there's our family there's there's like kind of the core and and to your point that's a personal thing i mean i guess health is probably universal some people still don't give yeah. a fuck about health but um you know it's it's <laughs> universal and so we should really kind of focus on that and then from there, how do we know? Because, you know, I turn on the TV and it's like, oh, you know, if you don't buy this Toyota truck, you're not a man. Or, you know, if you don't dress like yeah. Kim Kardashian, then you're not hot. And, and there's so much messaging that's so confusing and people just don't even know how to prioritize like what actually matters. Yeah, it's um, my metric for what, a, what to care about and what not to is, is determined by the quality of the problem it gives you. And that is like, it's a very backwards thing. Like most people don't think in those terms, but um, a big part of my message is don't chase after, you know, what's going to make you feel great. It's easy for everybody to have dreams of, you know, being this rock star who's got billions of dollars and a yacht and whatever. But people don't think about the problems that are associated with, the, with their dreams, with whatever they fantasize about. And so I always urge people instead of choosing your dreams, choose the problems you want. Choose the the struggles that you enjoy or that you care about. Um, and when you frame things in that way, it, it grounds them a lot more. So it's easy to like watch a commercial and be like, oh man, I wish I had a big truck. When you start thinking about what problems are associated with that, um, it gets real very quickly and it starts to feel unrealistic. And it's very, I think it's much easier for people to be like, oh, that doesn't make sense. I don't I don't need that or I don't want that. Um, I think what people eventually find is that those few things in your life, those things that you end up being passionate about, um, those things that feel very meaningful, it's they ultimately come down to problems that you enjoy dealing with or problems that you love dealing with. Hmm. Um, you know, like an easy an easy example or a pretty common example is like raising kids. You know, every on a purely like superficial level, raising kids is not pleasurable a lot of times. Pain in the it's, ass. It's total pain in the ass. Yeah, but, just... um, but if you ask most parents, it's it's a problem or it's a struggle that they enjoy having, that they're mm. grateful for having. You wouldn't so, trade it. Yeah, yeah, and so you just look for that in other areas of your mm. life, in your job, in your friendships, and your hobbies. It's funny. I have a, a lot of kind of high net worth people out here where I live in California. And, um, you know, a lot of them are close friends and all this. And, you know, billionaires, right? The guys with the yachts and the multiple houses and, you know, whatever the hell they want. And over the years, I've watched almost all of them start to liquidate all those things because they're like, damn it, you know, I'm so stressed out about not getting on that yacht. And, you know, then my crew has parties there and then it costs me like a gajillion dollars. And, and it's just yeah. like, it's more stress getting these things. And it's not the stress that they, they actually want. So it's like, you know, it's one guy sold all his houses and just goes to hotels now, wherever he goes and leaves his towel on the floor and walks out. Right. And, it, yep. and it's really kind of cleared the, the cash, if you will. He's, he's not stressing about those things anymore. So he doesn't give a fuck. It, it's, it's like the great philosopher notorious big once said uh mo money mo problems <laughs> <laughs> i actually had that line in my book but my editor was like she had you pull uh, it oh come on yeah that's where, that's where you get a fight back come on <laughs> it's really funny that's really funny so so do you have a framework okay so if you basically think about 
what your struggles would be, looking down the barrel of this thing that you are you know, deciding to do or not, uh, the struggles that would come with it, are those struggles that you can live with? Is that kind of like the general operating system for, for things as, as they come in, whether or not you take them or not? Yeah, that's the general principle. Any, anything else around that? Like, is there any other kind of matrix or structure that can help us think that through? Well, there, and then, I mean, there's kind of, um, there's a number of things that are kind of attached to that or that come along with that. Um, and so I, I talk a lot about beliefs and I believe very strongly in self-skepticism. Um, I have a chapter in the book called Why I'm Wrong About Everything and So Are You. Mm. <laughs> and uh, it's, I think it's very important that people don't get so attached. I mean, if you think about it, right, like if you think about yourself 10 or 20 years ago, what you believed was true or important about your life. If you think about it now, you're kind of like, mm. you, cr you cringe a little bit. You're, you're, you're like, wow, I was really naive. But if you think about it, yourself probably 20 years from now is going to look back at yourself today and think the same thing. It's like, oh, wow, I kind of didn't really know what I was doing. And I think life is just this constant process of becoming slightly less ignorant and slightly less wrong in our assumptions. Mm. And I think it's incredibly important to always keep that in mind in whatever we're doing. It's not necessarily like just believing that everything we're going to do is going to be wrong. It's more just remaining skeptical and flexible about all of our assumptions. Uh, because I, I, I believe that when people, people, when they get too certain about specific things, uh, that's when they start to get themselves into trouble and that's when they often start getting into trouble with other people. Uh, I think in many ways, a lot of, and it's funny, there's a, there's actually a popular psychology, there's a lot of research behind this and there's a popular psychology book written about this is that in many ways, evil comes from a, a rational sense of certainty mm. and, um, and that applies to the big things, but I think that also applies to the little things. You know, people that are certain that, you know, they need to have a Ferrari to be happy or people who are certain that, um, you know, their husband has to be a certain way for the relationship to work. Like, you, you need to be able to let go of these things a little bit and just let them be wrong sometimes and be okay with that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of parallels there between that and, like, say, the deconstruction of the ego, you know, and, and how, yeah. you know, we put so much energy into the storefront of who we need people to see us as and all, all this bullshit that is exhausting. Yeah. yeah, and so you're saying don't take yourself so seriously. Um, you know, understand that you're probably wrong and, yeah. and you know, and, and you'll, you'll come to that realization in time anyway, so you might as well just kind of stop putting too much energy into that now. You know, there's, there's so much of this kind of self-affirming stuff, you know, I just think of like the old kind of spoofs on the self-help people standing in front of the, like the mirror, you know, saying, you know, I love myself, I am this, I am rich, I am wealthy, I am, and, and, and I think it's gone too far. Uh, obviously, you think it's yeah. gone too far. So. Yeah. You're obviously contradicting a lot of the kind of self-help advice that's out there um, and flying in the face of, of what I think is probably needs an overcorrection. So, you know, what inspired you to do that? Like, have you been in that community? Have you just been kind of watching it going, what the hell are these people talking about? Yeah, I got, I got way into self-help stuff um, around the time I was in college and in my early adulthood. And I got kind of sucked up in, in some of that stuff. Um, you know, I read a lot of books. I went to a couple seminars. I started, like, trying to do some of these practices. And I, I mean, it, it's probably not self-help's fault, but I look back at that time. I mean, a lot of it was very useful. A lot of it benefited, ben, benefited me a lot. But I feel like uh, what it did to me and what it did to some of the people who were close to me back then was it took somebody who I was in the beginning, I was irrationally underestimating myself. Like I felt bad about myself, but for no, not really a good reason. And instead of correcting that, it basically taught me to irrationally feel good about myself, basically feel good about myself for no particularly good reason. <laughs> and, um, and while that's, better in many ways, 
it it causes its own problems and um and I started to experience those problems you know as the years started to go on what are those problems and look I, like I, like what 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 is that I, what's the symptom of that like when you, when when that starts to shake out like it is self self absorption really like it's it's everything that goes wrong in your life is a blessing and you know people who uh you know, try to confront you or call you out on your bullshit, you see them as, you know, oh, they're just, they're not as evolved as I am and they don't, they can't handle like my growth or whatever. Mm. And, and it's, and it's really, <laughs> it, it's just, you're just being a dick, you know, like yep. <laughs> there's, there's no way around it. <laughs> oh my God. That is, that is like the quintessential kind of Malibu, LA, Manhattan spiritual asshole, right? <laughs> I am better than you because I fucking do yoga. So step back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you call me an asshole, you're just projecting. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, totally. Yeah. It must be you. <laughs> it's obviously your fault. <laughs> so, okay. uh, and so, yeah, I got kind of sucked into that. But it, it was uh, uh, there were a couple people who were close to me that uh, got. Like I had some really bad falling outs with them, and it made me start to question, like, like wait a second, I used to think this was like a very evolved, you know, self-actualized person, and now they're like acting like a child and mm. treating me like I'm a child, you know, like what's going on here? And that that's when I really started to become kind of skeptical, and I started to really dive into a lot of. Uh, like academic research about like what happiness is, where it comes from, um, and and realize that the answers that a lot of academics are coming to is completely different than what the self help world says. Mm. I remember um, interviewing a guy a couple of years ago, and I'll never forget it. He was this um, self help dude, right? But he was he was in the money realm because if you're going to help people, you might as well help yourself get rich. Um, and right. <laughs> and he, he he was like, oh, I have this methodology. It was all this kind of like manifestation shit, right? And I go, oh, so you figured this out. You made a bunch of money, and then you wanted to help people kind of do what you did. He goes, no, I dreamt this up in the shower, and then I just started teaching people about it, and that's how I got rich. And, and yeah. I'm sitting here shaking my head thinking, you son of a bitch. That is everything that's wrong with the world. Like, <laughs> yes. What? <laughs> like you don't even know if it works. You're just selling it to people, and they and they believe you. <laughs> like, ew. Yeah, I I have this. I have an idea for an article that I want to write, but I haven't totally worked up the courage to write it yet. But I I, I want to call it like something like the Internet Pyramid Scheme, but or the Self Help Pyramid Scheme, mm. where you have people who teach seminars, who have seminars where they teach people how to host seminars teach people how to make money hosting seminars and it's just like this constant or or people Meta, who are a life bro. coach <laughs> yeah it, people all who are life coaches who teach all their clients how to become life coaches so they can go out and teach their clients how to become life coaches and it's it's just it's it's the same old like you know stuff ten dollars into an envelope and send it to 20 people or whatever you know have you seen the bit jp sears did on that maybe like a month or yeah. two ago uh, yeah, he, he's, I love on, it. he's on the he's on the show later today. Uh, I just taking the piss out of that is, I think, one of the most noble things one can do for for humanity <laughs> here. Because because yeah. that's just it's it's predatory stuff. People all just want to like fly off and be spiritual and forget about their past, and and it's bullshit. We know that that doesn't work. And so I'm yeah. really like I, I I appreciate what you're doing here because you're not you're not an asshole. You just you know you're yeah. not full of it either. That's that's the difference, right? And all these people yeah. who are full of it. Are out there making money and preying on you know people who actually have pain. I mean, people have trauma, and then they kind of go off and get lost in spiritual Neverland, um, and, it, and it ain't right. Yeah. Um, yeah. You talk about entitlement a fair amount in the book, and this culture of entitlement. I'd love to tease that out a little bit more because it's it's so pervasive that it's hard to even know that you're in it. It's like a fish a fish in water, uh, you know, especially in certain parts of the country. Mm -hmm. I, I define entitlement a little bit more broad than I think most people uh, consider it. I basically consider it anybody who believes that they deserve special treatment or they deserve something without necessarily like earning it. And you know, the immediate example that comes to mind is somebody who 
uh, you know, that the stereotype of the millennial who gets out of college and is like, where's my six figure job? And, and, you know, demands that their parents like pay their rent or something like that. And yeah, you do have a fair amount of that, but, um, it's not just to me, entitlement doesn't just, uh, embody like a financial thing or like, a a, a work related thing. There's also a lot of emotional entitlement that I, I feel like we're kind of being, that's, that's starting to pervade, pervade the culture where we feel like we have a right to be happy all the time. We, we feel like we have a right to not be offended. We feel like we have a right to uh, not be sad or depressed or not have to be embarrassed or have things about unsavory things about ourselves, you know, exposed for others to see. And uh, this, ju- in my opinion, this just creates way more dysfunction. And it's it's becoming it's actually becoming when you when you kind of zoom out and and define entitlement a little more broadly, I, I do think it's everywhere. And I don't think it's just with young people. I think it's I think it's with boomers. I think it's with just the culture in general, Shit, man, look at manifest destiny. I mean, you know, we have a right to a white picket fence when, you know, Syrian refugees are like, you know, living on railroad tracks trying to like save their children and then like just the world ain't fair. But you know we're yeah. entitled to everything, right? And, and right. so it doesn't it doesn't mean we should roll over and die. But I mean it just it's just not right, right? It's just it's yeah. it's not like reality, and the world doesn't work that way, right? It's like yep. I had someone who um, you know was born in uh, Ghana and under some really terrible circumstances that came to us the other day, and you know just wanted some help, and I was just like. You know, my kids were born in, you know, Newport Beach, California, and they eat organic produce every day, and, you know, they're complaining about stupid shit, right? And this yeah. ki- in this in this kid, um, you know, had to grow up watching, you know, mom and sister get raped, and it just, just horrible. So, you know, you look at right. all that, it's just you can't right. reconcile that. Yeah, and it's, and look, like, everybody has problems. Like, the, the most rich, or, rich, pampered kid has problems, and those are going to feel very real to him what and that's okay but like what when it becomes inappropriate is when that rich pampered kid starts to believe that he has a right to not have problems that Mm. he doesn't deserve to have his problems and um you know there's nothing wrong with with being born well off or very privileged or you know having having great things in your life yeah yeah and it's but it's you you never get to you're never above the struggle of life like you're never above like dealing with the same unpredictable shit that flies at everybody and um and i think that the problem is is that so much of our culture is kind of being built around the idea that we don't deserve it you know it's it's advertisements and TV shows and, and self-help seminars, you know, telling you like, oh, you deserve to be happy all the time. You don't deserve to deal with these problems in your life. And it's like, no, fuck you. You totally deserve it. Like, <laughs> we, this is what we all have to deal with. This mm-hmm. is life. Like, things suck sometimes. And that is just how things are. Mm-hmm. And you can't, uh, you can't forget that. It's funny, actually, like when I was uh, early on in the book, um, I was talking to, I think I was meeting with publishers and, and they asked me, they're like, can you sum up the book in like two sentences? And I was like, uh, life really sucks sometimes. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, okay, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah. They're like, oh, it sounds great. Here's some money. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> now go spend the next year of your life working your ass off getting this book done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Do you feel it's different in America than other countries? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much like international exposure you've had, but you know the cultures are very different. I've had, I've actually had tons. Uh, I lived abroad for seven years and I've traveled pretty extensively, and that's actually been very influential on a lot of my ideas. Um, it's interesting. You you see, I think I think America we we have our own little brand of entitlement that we've we've kind of fostered here it it tends to be a lot more consumer based and materially based you know everybody thinks that they're what's that steinbeck quote it's like the problem with them with the united states is that 
every poor person believes that they're just a a millionaire with bad luck. Um, <laughs> but it's you do see this to greater or less degrees in other parts of the world, but you don't I don't you don't see this particular brand of entitlement or, or self absorption. You don't see like I, I I lived in South America for a number of years and, and down there it's like one of the things I loved and that really drew me to that to Latin culture was like if you're upset, you can be upset. You can like scream and cry and like say this is horrible and I this is I'm really upset and like everybody stands around and they're like, Oh hey, it's okay, man. It's like, yeah, get it out. Get you know, mm. go for it. And um you know, where I, I, as I feel like, because like back in the US, if I ever like screamed and cried and said something was horrible, and my friends would have told me, you know, to like do affirmations or go to a yoga class or like. Dude, you need you therapy. Know, like, yeah, exactly. You control you know, your like, anger, man. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's fascinating seeing those different, the different values in the different cultures. You, you mentioned that emotions are overrated. That's a, a piece in the book that you're, you're talking about emotions and how, you know, how much we've been kind of trained to like lean into them. What's your take on that in terms of how we can care less about the kind of the passing phases that come and go? I think the key is to, to develop a way to separate judgment from the emotion. So most people, if they start feeling something negative, they immediately assume that something's wrong or that something that something's gone wrong or that something's inappropriate or or that they screwed up somehow. And I think it's really important that people realize that sometimes you can feel a bad emotion for a good reason. Um, sometimes you can feel a good emotion for a bad reason. And it's emotions aren't destiny. They're simply they're literally biological feedback mechanisms in our body that were designed to like help us not get eaten by tigers and stuff like that. So it's feel the emotion, acknowledge the emotion, but don't attach your your value judgment to the emotion. Your value judgment needs to be separate of your emotions. Everyone wants to be happy. Right. Right. Everyone just, you know, it's like, I just want to be happy. What do I got to do to be happy? Okay, you know what? I was happy and then you walked in the room and you took away my happiness. So fuck you. Now I'm not happy. Right. And it's just like that yeah. happy is this thing that's like put up on this pedestal and it's just like yeah. happy or bust. And you see that everywhere, right? Yeah. How? I like that happy or bust. <laughs> You know, and, and so you, you see that and everyone in our culture wants more and more of that. And it's not real, right? You can't live up there. You yeah. know, the hot air balloon has to come down. You know, it's all, it's, it's, it's all kind of an imbalanced way of looking at it. So what? So what, do we not strive for things? Do I not want success? Do I just not give a fuck about anything? Do I not care if my kids get grades, good grades at school? Where do you draw the line, right? Because, you know, I know yeah. like some parent is listening to this going like, okay, dude, hold on. What about this? What about that? Right, and so again, that my understanding of this is it falls back into that matrix of priorities of what you should give yep. a fuck about. Yeah, yeah, it's it's you should pursue things, you should care about things, but the I guess one of the overarching messages of the book is that it shouldn't simply be based on feeling good. You know, if if feeling good is such a high priority all the time, like just go do a bunch of heroin or something. Like mm. it doesn't. It's easier. But it, yeah, it's easier and it's it's more expensive. But like it's like when you put it that way, people are immediately like, "Oh, heroin!" But yeah, that's just like throwing my life away. Well, yeah, but <laughs> and what makes you think like pursuing happiness twenty four seven and all these other ways is gonna be any better? Like it's you have to find something that is worth the struggle, like that is worth the pain, that is worth the associated problems, because they are gonna come. Like you can't. There's no nothing. There's no life where nothing goes wrong, and so you need to choose your pursuits based on the associated problems, not on the associated pleasures. Find something in your life that that the problems are worth it to you, that the problems are even something that invigorates you or or excites you, and then the pleasure is going to happen as a side effect. Like, mm -hmm. it, I mean, if you just imagine, like, I mean, for me, for instance, writing, like, I. A lot of times I get people who email me and they're, 
they they complain that they try to write and they don't know how and they get really upset and then they procrastinate for months and and they never publish anything and and they say it's really hard it's really nerve-wracking i get really anxious and then i beat myself up about it and i'm like yeah that's basically what writing is <laughs> you know it's mm -hmm. just for whatever reason the way i'm built or the way i grew up or something i enjoy that like i get excited about it yeah it's hard it's 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 anxiety inducing but like it invigorates me and it's something mm -hmm. that um that i've learned that i'm 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 good at that struggle um and so i i end up pursuing it and if if you're able to just enjoy the negative aspects of a pursuit then like everything you know the positive just becomes gravy at that point it's funny i say this a lot on, on the show uh, the the translation of the word kung fu um, one translation is hard work and the other one is eat bitter and so when one martial artist asks another you know how's your kung fu it's not like how, you know, how many guys did you beat up last week but how are you metabolizing reality and eating bitter and, and being able to be, become stronger through it, right? It's like, how are you taking on the hard stuff and, and, and you know, moving through that kind of discomfort of saying, yeah, I'm gonna you know, hit publish on this, on this thing and then people are gonna judge me or maybe they're not, I don't know. Maybe I should yeah. just stay at home and not do anything, right? And, and to step through that and get into that uncertainty um, and do it anyways um, and be vulnerable, that's, you know, that, that's a, a very good human quality. And I think a lot of the self-help universe has has kind of directed us away from some of that like just core work ethic and you know look if you get knocked down you get back up but you're gonna get yeah. knocked down so it's okay yeah yeah don't judge yourself for being down i think that's one of the biggest problems is people think oh i got knocked down like what's wrong with me is am i a loser like am i just destined to be a loser or to get knocked down over it it's like no you just shit happens well, you go ask any, like, go to, go to the top, like, go to Mike Tyson and be like, have you ever been punched in the face? You know, he's going to laugh, right? Like, you get to, you know how many times <laughs> yeah. that guy's gotten punched, right? <laughs> it never feels good to get punched in the face. But, you know, he was a champ yeah. because despite all the punches, he, you know, he landed more and he, you know, he was resilient. So, man, I, I love it. I love, um, I love your stance. I love uh, kind of the irreverence of it, but the the sincerity of who you are uh, and what you're doing uh, as part of this message, right? Is you're not being irreverent for irreverence sake because those guys are fucking stupid, right? Yeah. You're being, you're being yeah. irreverent because you're holding, you're holding to something that people need to look at and that's what makes it awesome. So I, I appreciate where you're coming from. It's really cool. Thanks, man. Yeah, appreciate so the that. book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck um, and it's releasing uh, very soon. Uh, what's, what's, the, what's the pub date? Tuesday, September 13th. September 13th. So, yeah, um, I love it. I love what you're doing. Good luck with all of it, and uh, keep up the good work. And yeah, don't and don't and don't let them pull your punches. I like it. I like what you're doing. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, man. Cool, man. Thanks for being here. Thanks.